who the hell are the deities and what the hell do they actually want? Are they helping humanity out of the goodness of their heart or do they have an ulterior motive? What's the name of the game with them? And I'll tell you straight up that every single deity is built. Some more consciously than others. Like some of them are aware they're building gods. And, you know, and I know for sure the Egyptians were masters at designing deities. And other groups are doing it with less uh, with less forward planning and more just sort of stumbles into it. Now, I'm going to call, I'm going to talk about a school of magic called chaos magic. And it's called chaos magic because it's about building spirits from scratch and then having them as servants and they grow and they expand in power until you lose control of them and then the chaos starts. And that's why it's called chaos magic. It's a thing. You know, Google it, I dare you. Now, I built the, I, I tested this, I did this myself. I built a couple of deities a few years back. And, um, and they were nice ones that were going to do good things that just help people in general. They would just fly around and be helpful. But you see, deities are hungry. They need to be fed. Oh, sorry. At this, I call them spirits. And if you go deep enough into chaos magic, the first level of spirit, they call an egregore. And it's, it's a lot like a little baby bird that's just come out of the egg and it just cheep, 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 cheeps for more food. And then it goes to level eight, which is a self, which is a self-sustaining deity. Now, these, uh, these things need to be fed. And so what do they eat? They eat two things. They eat human thought and devotion and prayer. And the other thing they like is sugar. You see, the Buddhists have, you know, like hundreds of different uh, deities on their books. And if you go to a Buddhist shrine, they will have offerings there. And the offerings they give to these, to these, de to these deities and proto-deities, I think we'll call them, um, are all very, very sugary things. The, the stuff that when it, it's the opposite of health food, it's like, uh, a 90% sugar biscuit with marshmallow and jam in the middle, you know, and there's no nutritional value in it at all. And this is the sort of things that these deities like because sugar gets turned directly into energy. And you know, there's in Australia we have Olympic athletes who um, who train for four hours, eat two Mars bars, and then train for four more hours because they're just working off the sugar. The sugar is ex is turning directly into energy, which is also a trick that these guys can do. And I did have the privilege privilege of eating some of these used um, used offerings, is the right word. And they tasted like cardboard. Like there wasn't even any sugar in them. There was not like they were flat and tasteless. That was like the worst thing you could eat because all of the goodness has been sucked out of it by these by these gods. And so you need to feed young spirits and you and you know sugar's a really good way but i lived in bali for a little while and they have these uh these compounds where grandma and grandpa live there and their four or five kids live there and all of their families live there too so like this is you know there's like 50 people or tw between 20 and 50 people living there all with the same family name and quite often there'll be a family shrine and at the family shrine, it's usually grandma or auntie or uncle or grandpa or someone like that who prays to the shrine every day. Now, the shrine is not an inanimate object. It is the home of the family spirit or the family pet spirit, I'm going to say. What they do is they give the, uh, they quite often offer rice, which is like 70% sugar, more sugar than any, any other cereal. You know, they they pray to the they pray to their spirit. They give they give offerings to their spirit, and they say, "Can you help little Jane with her schooling? Can you help little Johnny mend his broken leg? Can you help protect the family? Can you make sure that Uncle Bob's business deal goes well? Whatever it is, right? And what you're doing is you are paying the spirit to go and perform tasks for you that you can't. It is a contractual deal." Think of the family. Um, think of the family spirit as 
something like a dog. And I, I, I don't I don't like the analogy completely because dogs, when you say dog, it's like a they're considered a lower life form for no good reason. Um, but there's none of that going on. It's like a dog can work as a as a as a guard. A dog will will stay up all night to make sure nobody comes in the compound. A dog will play with your kids and have a good time. A dog will be friendly with everybody. Your dog will identify friend or foe because if somebody comes in the compound and they growl at them, they know that's a bad guy. But if they've introduced and they're shown that they trust that you're, they're trusted by members of the family, the dog will welcome them in. The dog is performing tasks that the humans can't. They can sniff out danger. You know, a dog will even eat rats that are, that are running around the, the compound. But humans can't do those things. And so they keep this animal around so that it can perform tasks for them that are difficult for the humans to do on their own. But, you know, there are limitations. Like that dog will never earn a dollar for the family. It, it will never get a job. You know, it, it'll sleep all day if it wants. And, you know, it's, it's not a perfect deal, but it does do things for the family that the family can't do for itself. And the spirit's no different. And so they co-opt the talents of the spirit, of the family spirit, to perform tasks for them that they can't perform for themselves. And, you know, we'll just call it luck for the family. You know, a, a luck is a, is a catch-all term for all of the different tasks that it can do. I do know from my personal experience, they are always hungry. They always want to grow. They always want to expand and become more. And they, you know, like dogs, they can create a very affectionate relationship with the humans, but they're still fundamentally a different type of being and their goals and interests are very different. And so in some of the houses that I saw in Bali, like they have, grandma seems to have been captured by the family spirit because grandma all grandma thinks about is making offerings to the shrine she's praying there four or five times a day right and this is the hindus this is not the muslims this is the just the hindus who do this and um and and i do remember from my personal experience when i had these very very young spirits they were like little birds in the nest cheeping feed me feed me feed me give me your attention play with me play with it it's constant Absolutely constant and exhausting. I couldn't, I couldn't do that all day. And eventually, after they grew a couple of steps and were a little bit more self-sufficient, I just released them into the wild because it just absorbed too much of my time. One of those spirits survived, one of them did not. And that's okay. It's just the, the wild west out there. You know? And here's the thing. like If somebody stops praying at the family shrine, it's no different from if somebody stops feeding the family dog. What's going to happen? It's going to roam outside the compound and try and find something to eat. And that's when it starts behaving like a demon. It's not exactly a demon, but it's going to do things to feed its, to feed its starving self that may or may not be helpful to everybody else. So now I've talked about how they grow and where they come from. And then I'm going to now I'm going to talk about ah look and I will say in India there is a um, there's a state somebody's made the estimation that there are three hundred thousand deities on the subcontinent of India and what are they talking about every village has the village deity and everybody in the village wants their you know they pray to that to that deity for good crops good luck rain sun you know uh, to, to get rid of sickness, whatever it is that the, the village needs, they pray to the, to, their, to the village deity. So it's entirely conceivable that there are 300,000 deities running around. And so now I'm going to talk about how deities have been used. And I'm going to, I'm going to use three very different examples. I'm, going to, I'm, not, I'm going to avoid Hinduism now. I'm going to talk about Egyptian Roman and Nordic or Viking gods and the different ways that they were formed. You see, the Egyptians absolutely knew what they were doing in terms of building deities. They were very, very good at it. And so what they would do is they wouldn't try and build one from scratch. They would take the blueprint of an animal 
So like if we use say Horus, they use the hawk or bust, they use the cat. And so they take the energetic blueprint of the cat and then change a few parts out. It's not like it's like not building a car from scratch. It's like taking a chassis that's already exists, buying a chassis and then adding making your own modifications. And so then they would add human qualities to them, human knowledge, things that are of values to humans and not cats. I'll talk about the one of the jaguar Sekhmet. Sekhmet was a, is a warfare goddess. She's like a Kali goddess. She's a destruction goddess. And her head is the jaguar. So what does that tell you? It says that the original blueprint for that deity was the jaguar. And they just made modifications to the jaguar spirit. I'm sorry, I, they duplicated and then made modifications to the duplicate spirit for jaguar. That would be more technically correct. And they taught her everything. You know, and jaguars is a good start for warfare. They're hunters. They're, they're vicious. They're sneaky. And they're aggressive, all of the things that you need for warfare. And then they taught it strategy and they taught it um, that all of the warriors prayed their warrior knowledge into that deity. Um, all of their fancy moves, all of their commanders prayed their strategies into it or their their knowledge of, of warfare and, um, and tactics and these kinds of things so that they built themselves a deposit of knowledge extent it's like like a library of military strategy is in Sekhmet. it's not you know it's not per, it's not a perfectly accurate description of everything that Sekhmet is but this is one of the purposes that one of the purposes that that the egyptians used Sekhmet for yeah, good now i'm going to talk about the vikings or the nordics they have two major deities there thor and freya right and Thor and Freya are dynamic deities. They are evolving with the culture. And so the like with um once Sekhmet is completed, you only download from Sekhmet. The upload process is something they're not really doing. But with Thor and Freya, there is an upload-download process, and the two of them are constantly evolving. What did the what did the Nordics use Thor and Freya for? It's the perfect blueprint for Thor is the perfect blueprint for everything a man should be. And Freya is the perfect blueprint for everything a woman should be. In their society, the qualities of, of, a, of a man to be strong and brave and, you know, be a part-time soldier, because I think most of them were, but also to be a farmer and a family man. And also right down to having great adventures in his youth, just like Thor did. These are the qualities that they admire in Norse men. And it's the same story for Norse women, where they where they get in contact with Freya and their femininity. Blah, 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 blah. Their femininity is absorbed through, not absorbed, but honed or directed or um, some word I might use. Uh, it's a blueprint that they can download from. You know, if they have a problem, say with their fertility, they can download perfect fertility from Freya. But also, they know that this is an evolving deity, so they, you know, so they also put the very best of themselves in there. There's an exchange. You know, they talk to Odin uh, for power and for spells and for knowledge, but. Offerings were usually food were made to these gods so that they could eat. Uh, they also used blood a lot, not a lot, but it was a significant blood and sacrifice were a significant part. It's not the only part, but they were a significant part of their relationship with those deities. Because as it turns out, when when something dies, its three D body collapses, its five D soul runs off and does some other thing. And then the 4D spirit collapses and forms a pool of energy. And that is what the point of sacrifice so that it can be used to pay the particular deity for a particular task. Do you have any questions at this point? What was the difference between the 4D and the 5D? Soul, personality? 5D soul, 4D spirit. Soul, gotcha. Connects a lot of dots. Say again. Um, what you've been saying, it connects a lot of dots, um, makes 
a lot of sense with what I've seen going on around. Yeah. Here's, here's the next step in what I want to talk about is where um, the Romans actually stole the gods off the Greeks. And so you have you have all you have uh, different deities. The Roman deities are copies of the Greek deities. The Romans realized that that the Greeks had a better pantheon, and there's a reason why. And so they stole it and just uh, gave them local names, gave them Italian names or uh, Latin names. And just started worshiping them, worshiping them at their own temples. And the Greeks did something really interesting with their deities. See, the Greeks were also astronomers, and they were really into the heavenly bodies. What they did is they took an imprint of the heavenly bodies, like the sun, the sun, the moon, uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Then they named the days of the week after them. And if you hear them, um, if you hear the, the words of the days of the week in Italian, Monday is lunes after the moon. Um, Tuesday is martes after Mars. Wednesday is mercoles after Mercury. Thursday, jueves after Jupiter. Um, Friday, viernes, which is Venus. And uh, Sabato, which is, it actually works better in English, which is Saturn Day. And then uh, Domingo or Sunday, which is worship of the sun. And they managed to link the deities. The deities that they brought to earth are blueprints of the energies from different planets. Now, I don't know why Neptune, who was a copy of this god of the sea, Poseidon, I don't know why he didn't get a day of the week or Pluto, the god of the underworld, why he didn't get a day of the week or Uranus didn't get a day of the week either. I don't know. I don't think they could see those. Um, those. Well, it's weird because, I'm sorry, no, I think what happened is they couldn't see those planetary bodies without a telescope and it wasn't until after they were discovered that they were called after Roman gods. I think that's what happened. But they didn't get a day of the week anyway, so well, um, that yeah, that's a, a problem. That so, but they blueprinted those deities from planets. So just in the same way the Egyptians used animals as a blueprint, and then modified them, modified the animals' knowledge for their own needs. So too did the Greeks, and then the Romans borrowed it from them. Uh, the knowledge of the planets as deities with some modification. There you go. Does that give you a sense of who they are now? That they're, they're not so, and there's one thing that's ridiculous in my mind, and that is the worship of a god. Because we built all of these things. And I, I like Ferraris, and Ferraris are built by humans, but there's no, and it's high engineering. But there's no way I would worship a Ferrari. There's no, this just doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever that we would build something so we can worship it. It's just stupid and ridiculous. But these things are intelligent and resourceful. And so I will talk about the Hare Krishnas a little bit. Now, the Hare Krishna religion is devotion to a god called Krishna, it's the worship of Krishna. And if you're a Hare Krishna, that's all you do. I spent time with Hare Krishnas. They mumble Hare Krishna all day, you know, 24 hours, all their waking hours, they're mumbling Hare Krishna. I, I was doing some construction work for these guys. And what was on the radio? What was the music they were playing? Hare Krishna chanting I, for eight hours a day. Can you, can you, the braver man than I who could do that for a long time. But these guys, they worship Krishna and they give they give their thought energy, they give their word, they give their hearts to Krishna, their offerings of uh, food are continuous. And what's going on here? All right, the word Hare Krishna Rama. Now, I don't have a good translation for it, but what it does allow the um, Krishna to do is to, let's say, Krishna, I've got some sadness. You want to take away my sadness, Krishna? Krishna goes, 
Great, I'll take your sadness. And what am I going to put in its place? I know I've got a I've got a good idea of what happiness is. So I'll just copy and paste myself into that human. And if you go there for years and years, like a lot of people do, you will absorb, you will become more Krishna than you are you. And that's not what you're here to do. You're not here to become Krishna. They even venerate a particular state of being called Krishna Loka, in which you've become more Krishna than yourself. You're, you're, you're sort of called Krishna on the earth is one of the ways that they, they would describe that. And this whole religion just serves that deity. It doesn't serve the people who, who are part of that religion. It just serves the deity. It doesn't serve anyone else. The whole thing is for a benefit, is for the benefit of something we built to serve us. I don't know how it got so backwards, but it's happened. And it's, a, and it's an international movement. Anybody's guess what's going on there. Anybody's guess. I um, think people people naturally want to worship something that's <clears throat> long past, that's not a current thing. If it was down at the town square right now, we'd be like, bullshit. But if you say 200 years ago, there was this man. It there helps. Was this, it yeah, sure it's helps, doesn't it? It's a heck of a lot easier to believe in the old prophets and the all the old magic. Well, look, you know, you guys are here talking to a modern-day prophet or whatever the hell I am. Um, you know, but I'm not trying to, the story, the stories that I'm giving you are just based in common sense, I think, right? So not common sense, but a very grounded and realistic thing without any mystic mumbo jumbo, without any um, sacredness or veneration involved in what I'm doing. I'm not trying to, I'm not, exp I'm, not I'm explaining this in engineering terms. I'm not explaining this in mystical terms, which I hope is refreshing. I hope it's a... It's you cut, a, you a, cut out a lot of the bullshit when it comes down to it. You're kind of like, all right, they're not helping us. We got to help ourselves. It's it's more of a practical, make sense angle, I think. Yeah, thank you. Practical spirituality. Yeah, okay. I can roll with that. Thank you. Yeah, I do have one more example of the deity-human relationship gone weird does anybody know about the um community in india called oroville does anybody know of that place anybody heard of it well let me tell i went there let me tell you a story it had uh the guru who started it was a, a lady called mama i uh, forget you know like her, her name got lost along the way and everybody just calls her mama and she with the with the work of her followers built herself a deity and the deity was a great servant to have. She's a very powerful wizard. She was able to harness the prayer and thought power of her devotees and turn it into a deity. It's awesome stuff. It's like really impressive uh, magical work. And then she tasked the deity with finding and creating the community for her. And so she, you know, with the deity working behind the scenes, she was incredibly lucky in everything she did in order to create this religious community. She did very, very well. Now, the deity was tasked with protecting community from everything outside the community and uh, working towards the longevity of the community. And then Mama died. And after that, nobody is controlling the deity. Now, I went there and they have a, a shrine there which is a five foot, a five story tall golf ball slash lotus flower looking thing. If you look it up online, you'll see pictures of it. It's a very unique building. Um, but you walk up to the fifth floor and in there is a giant piece of clear quartz, perfectly clear quartz manufactured by the same people who built the mirror on the Hubble telescope. And it's eight, it's a clear quartz ball, 80 centimeters across, it's huge. And so just like everybody else, I went up there to pray to it. And what's happening there? The energy that everybody's putting into that clear quartz sphere is going directly to the deity. And when I realized that the deity was doing this, it spat me out and threw me away. It goes, get out of here. I don't want you seeing me. So, and I thought, this is fascinating. This is amazing. Um, 
And so I started like praying on it, asking practical questions, going, what exactly is going on here? And the answer that I came up with is this. The last thing that Mama did, told the deity to do was to look after the community and make and prepare for the community's longevity. The deity is doing a good job and the local government is writing laws specifically for Oroville, specifically for the community that are very favourable. You can get Indian citizenship just through joining the community. Um, and that everything everything is streamlined for you if you want to join the community. But nobody joins the community. It has stayed at a population of 20,000 or 22,000 for the last 20 years, to my knowledge. It's not growing. And what happens there? And, it, and there's this David Attenborough springs to mind, right, where if a plant is being eaten by a particular kind of insect, sometimes it will make an alliance with an ant colony and the ant colony will protect it from the foreign insects. But that tree will never grow again. The, the ants will sweep all of the surplus that that plant has off the top and use it for the colony. It's a protection racket for the colon, for the, the plant is, is in a protection racket with the ant colony. And what I think has happened to Oroville is that the, uh, that the, community is in a protection racket with the original deity that built it and that the wizard who was supposed to be controlling that deity has died and nobody has taken control of the deity since absolutely wild turn of events but i think that's what's happened and you know if i if i can get in contact with oroville's best wizards we might actually be able to renegotiate the relationship between the between the deity and the community but everything's possible out there you know there's no and there's nobody policing any of this stuff so this is the relationships that are possible through with deities they are not to be worshipped they are not our servants either what would be your reasoning for re renegotiating anything with it well because then the community could grow again you know, oh, I yeah, yeah. Instead of it being like literally, uh, what's it stagnating the way it has been for the longest time? Yeah. So anyway, that's I'm going to stop recording now. Is there, is there any further questions that you guys have? Yeah, I got a question. Um, yeah. So you you talked about the Hari Krishna folks, and they keep repeating that same mantra, and the, uh, the deity resides in them. Is that could you apply the same to these? Um, high repetition mantra practices where they um, repeat a particular mantra. So, for example, um, to... Omniva Shivaya. Yeah, that one. Yeah. And also um, to some of the other deities like um, maybe Lakshmi or any of the other ones. And then they actually, there's a science mean in that they say if you do a thousand reps, you get this. If you do 10,000 or 100. So that's more of the de deity residing in you. That's what I think. Is it safe to say well, that? Look, okay. you, well, you've, you've, paid, you've paid that deity 10,000 units of thought or 10,000 units of speech or whatever it is that you've done, right? And that's a significant contribution to the deity. So it gives you something in exchange. So it can be malicious. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, you can request gifts, but I've been around for a long time and... I've worked and I've met a lot of mystics over the years. And the ones who use deities for everything, um, just kind of, they're just weirdos. They're just a little bit weird. Just between <laughs> you and me, right? Well, because the software they're downloading on for operating themselves as a human is not software for humans. It's software for deities. It's useful and in many cases, it's not specifically designed for humans. And one of the key things that a deity will put in a person if they've put in, say, a 1,000 repetitions or 10,000 repetitions is loyalty software. So Krishna puts in some software where I will always be devoted to Krishna. I love Krishna. I will spend all my time with Krishna. Krishna is the only way, blah, 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 blah. blah. Krishna, 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 as the story will go. 
Does that make sense if I say things that way? Oh, it makes sense. Excellent. Any more questions? Uh, so, so my recommendation in working with deities and with ascended masters is use them sparingly. Angels don't use them at all. Don't use them at all. Um, but, you know, if you're uh, in my other class, there's a guy who does uh, Muay Thai at a very high level. And it makes sense to him to pray to the God of war to be a better kickboxer, to be a better ring fighter. And I agree, it certainly does. The God of war knows stuff about that, knows stuff about fighting. Why not pray to Mars in that situation? And he does. But I said, you know, but sparingly for a particular purpose, you know what you're doing, spread yourself around between several other deities, between several deities, but don't make deity worship or deity interaction the mainstay of your spiritual uh, life because we created them. They're here to serve us and they do. They do a great job. Um, just recently, I was in a mission and we got stuck and I asked which deity has the answer to this. Horus knew exactly what to do. And he showed up and he did the work. He unraveled the puzzle 10 times faster than we than any of us humans could. But, you know, after that, we, we said thank you and he went on his way. They are libraries of knowledge that are available to us. But, you know, use them sparingly. And here's, the, here's a really important thing. Use the sphere or use your purging tools to clear out the loyalty part that is installed when you pray to a deity because that's the contract, that's the thing that binds you to them and that's the thing that's a little bit hostile in bringing you back. So it's contradictory to free will. It's not, it's not terrible. Like if you go over and visit a friend of yours and you have a good time, then, you know, you remember them well. But what would be weird is if they like planted a little bit in your consciousness to make you come back. That would be weird. And that's what a lot of deities do. Ayahuasca being one of them, of all, which is really interesting. So my recommendation is use them sparingly. Don't make them the mainstay of your spiritual life, of your prayer life. You know, you can pay them to do specific tasks. If you... Um, you want some money give lakshmi a kilo of sugar say lakshmi i want some money here's some sugar what can you what can you send my way or oh, ganesh is another good one like that the um the chinese buddhists have a deity specific to wealth they have a wealth deity because nowadays in china religion is the new money is the new religion is that a jid emperor yeah, something like that. I don't remember. I, I, I was told about it, but the name was in Chinese, so I almost instantly forgot it. Um, can you just elaborate on... on um, so you said sugar and some deities, some things need blood. Can you elaborate not, on that? Not because... need, no, not need blood. None of them need blood. Okay. But blood is a magical tool that has power. Blood, blood is not required by any of them. And, um, but, you know, be aware it's a currency. It's a spiritual currency. That, there you go. That's a way of putting it. Got you. I think, I think the second most used word after God in the Bible is blood. And the reason why the Christians hate or won't listen to any other religion, why they're so insular, is because Moses was told to avoid all of the other religions because all of the other religions and all the area there were all involved in sacrifice. And sacrifice magic is not is not a is not a way, is not something that they that the Christian God or the Hebrew God wanted to be involved in. It's not a positive thing. He didn't want that. And so he shunned other religions. You know, you'll have no other gods before me, I think is the third or fourth um, commandment. You'll have no other gods before me. And he's saying, don't get involved in animal sacrifice. Don't do it. Yeah.
So any other questions? And should we get involved? Yeah, yeah. Um, earlier you said don't work with angels at all. So I was just curious why. Um, I, I, did I, I, know, I don't know if we have, sorry, go ahead. I did a YouTube video on it called Calling Out Metatron. Um, okay. Because Metatron is both master of angels and demons. And I want you to think, and I want you to think of controlled opposition. And I want you to think of, imagine, imagine living in a city, right? Where the chief gangsters are these two brothers called Satan and Lucifer. And they've got their, their guys who are running around making trouble all over the place. And then you've got the chief of police who's, uh, whose title is Archangel Michael. Now, people will go to the police, but the police won't, sorry, they both, both of, all three of those guys work for Metatron. They are constructs of Metatron. And so he's, he sends the gangsters here to harvest the town. And then he corrupts the, the police force so that they will never actually shut down the gangsters. They'll never actually terminate the, um, the gangsters' organisation. They'll allow them to continue working. But what it does is it stops the people in the city from taking the law into their own hands and fighting the gangsters like they should. And it makes them depend on a controlled opposition called the angelics. Does that make sense when I say it that way? Kind of. <laughs> I'll have to yeah. I'll have to let it process a little bit. Yeah, no, it's um the the whole look, look the angels have been watching the demons do all sorts of terrible things for ten thousand years at least. Macy, they are you anything. more? Are they you haven't more, done anything. Is she more referring to maybe uh like our spirit guides, like our grandmother, or, or are you just talking in generals? Just no, things? I was I was talking about like angels in general because like when I do spiritual healings with my clients, I definitely work with different angelic beings and they help with the session so i didn't when you said don't work with angels i'm like well i do all the time but <laughs> yeah. no, well, look, i don't like them and but you know that's my shtick that's my spiel that's what i'm about um but what i will ask you to do is i will ask you to look at the loyalty software that they've installed in you Okay. And if they've installed loyalty so if they have installed loyalty software in you, that's contradictory to free will. Okay. Sorry, earlier you were saying the angels have been watching the demons do stuff for, you know, ten thousand years or whatever. And you're saying like they're just watching it but not actually doing anything to stop it. Exactly. They're kind of like letting it letting it all play out. Exactly. Okay. And I think that I think I think controlled opposition is the right word for them. Elbar, good uh I, what I what I do often is I appeal to either God the Father or my higher self, and I ask I ask from that position for angelic intervention on particular things. Does that make a difference? Yeah, it will. It will. Like the help they offer is limited, is is my experience. Like there's only so much they'll do for you. Yeah, it seems that uh, like the dark side are the watchers. And you know what kind of trouble they got themselves into. And the light side are really, as far as the Bible is concerned, are nothing more than messengers. And don't real and they don't really um don't take action. You know. Well, yeah, the war in the heavens, the the, the fight between angels and, and demons is a non event. Right? You know, there's there's no there's no hit squads of angels hunting down demons. It's not happening. You know, they're just a letting it's just peaceful coexistence between the two like it's it's but you know the, there's a lot of religious channeled material that is telling a very different story although then that starts that that uh rabbit hole of them hij aliens hijacking our dna and uh who did what when and how and well you know we're, we're just we'll just tackle these problems one at a time <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, just one at a time one thing at a time makes you crazy thinking about it your first reaction is to is to 
is not is ne never helpful or positive. You know, the first time anybody spoke to me about a reptilian, I said, I don't know why you're telling these lies, but it's dangerous and it's ugly and I don't want to be your friend anymore. And then three months later, I came back and said, so tell me more. <laughs> like, it, it's... There's there's a there's a there's a growth curve in it. You know, you have to you have to accept a certain number of things. But I think we might get into some meditations now, yeah?